Hi, my name is Dr. Evan Maladinoff, and on behalf of Dr. Richard Belly, the entire executive board of the ICAK USA chapter, and on behalf of all members of ICAK USA and internationally the past year since its inception in 1976, I am grateful to be able to host this Dr. David S. Walther tribute. Now, I wanted to approach this a little bit differently because a lot has been written about David's legacy. He was born March 19, 1937, and he passed on September 10, 2008. Uh, but some key interesting things that I want to big bet on with my wife, um, both David's mother and father were chiropractors. And so his legacy is chronicled. I'm going to give you a couple of references from Dynamic Chiropractic that will give you the details about his life as a chiropractor. I would like to just point out two very small pieces that were part of David before he became a member, founding member of ICAK, and that was he was chairman of the Delta Sigma Chi fraternity at Palmer Chiropractic College. He graduated in 1959 from Palmer, and he was chairman of the education committee of the Colorado Chiropractic Association for many years. And most importantly, he was married to his beloved wife, Jean, for 44 years. He published a number of textbooks which have been well chronicled, but again, I want to give you a different perspective about my mentor, uh, my colleague, my friend, Dr. David S. Walther. I'd like to quote from Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, verse 50, and verse 50 describes the forces of life and death. Every one of us is born and everyone <clears throat> dies. However, three of every ten seem to be born to live, three seem to be born to die, and three live lifefully or deathfully according to their chosen lifestyles. But there is one out of ten, they say, so sure of life that tigers and wild bulls keep clear. Weapons turn from him on the battlefield, rhinoceroses have no place to horn him, tigers find no places for claws, and soldiers have no place to thrust their blades. Why is this so? Because he dwells in that place where death cannot enter. Realize your essence and you will witness the end without ending. But there is one out of ten, they say, so sure of life that tigers and wild bulls keep clear. Weapons turn from him on the battlefield. Rhinoceroses have no place to horn him. Tigers have no places for claws, and soldiers have no places to thrust their blades. Why is this so? Because he dwells in that place where death cannot enter. Realize your essence, and you will witness the end without ending. I'd like to now share with you a discussion that I had with two of my very dear friends, the three of us grew up together professionally, and we were all under the tutelage of Dr. David S. Walther. It is a lengthy conversation. Dr. Ben Markham and Dr. Robert Blake were unable to be here, so we've recorded this for you, and we're going to now go to that videotape. Hi, my name is Dr. Evan Maladinov, and I have the pleasure of uh, sharing with two of my dear friends uh, some of our fondest memories of our, our mentor, our dear friend, uh, Dave Walther and what he meant to us and meant to the organization. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ben Markham to lead us off because he's known Dave longer than Bob Blake and myself. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Markham, take it away. Tell us about your first uh, contact, if you will, with uh, Dr. Dave Walther. Well, thank you. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to uh, be uh, among the group here to give tribute to our good friend and colleague, uh, Dave Walther. Um, my first memory goes back to probably 1959 or 1960, actually. I was having some intractable stomach cramping problems. Nobody in our family had ever been to a chiropractor. And a nurse actually recommends to my mom to go see this Dr. Walter. So we lived about 40 miles away. We go up to his office. Turns out he had a son. Dr. David, who had just graduated. And I was, if I was not his first new patient, it was very close to it. So I went to see the son. He was this good looking, handsome guy. He drove this gold, classy Mustang. And uh, of course he fixed my problem. And that, that was my 
my first experience. He used one of the things we'll I'm sure we'll talk about with Dave is Dave loved equipment. He loved to measure, to test and measure his results. And like George Goodhart, he, he loved equipment and tests. And I'll never forget for some of you, not some of you sophisticated national graduates, but from us from Palmer, there was a neural kilometer. Anybody remember neural kilometers? Uh, BJ Palmer, I think, may have developed it and measured imbalances paraspinally. Dave, of course, had to have the best equipment. It, it always had the best equipment. And he ran that, he had a neural kilometer, he would run down my spine and it had a graph that would print off. You could keep in your file, like nobody had those. Dave Walter, of course, even back then had the finest neural kilometer you could have. So that, that was my first experience. And I would, I'd get treated over the years. And he was the one that directed me to chiropractic college. And actually, as I was getting ready to go said, if you get a chance to, to listen to a doctor by the name of George Goodhart, don't miss it. Because he had just heard George at an ACA convention and was thoroughly impressed. And well, and as you got, as we all know, with, if Dave says something, he's a man of few words, and we typically would always listen to it because he was usually right. So that was my first, that was my first uh, dealings with Dave. Bob, what was your first uh, first contact? This is like <laughs> you were watching Ancient Aliens, or right? first contact with with the ancient world, right? Uh, so, what was your first contact with Dave? Well, my first contact was uh, was 1976. I was a student at National, and D Dave came and spoke to the students and to the AK Club, and I was so impressed with this guy who was. I mean, he was obviously so devoted to his craft and so uh, uh, doing, he had written a book at that point. It was re really, the book was the three ring binder that we all used back in the seventies. It was one of the first AK books that, but it was so well organized. And uh, he spoke to the, to the AK club and I uh, went up and introduced myself afterwards. And shortly after that, when I was, uh, near graduating, I uh, contacted him about potentially, uh, potentially associating in his practice. And uh, I, uh, a couple months after that, this was in 1977, I went to visit him for a day. And that was an amazing experience. So in this one day, from eight in the morning till 10 at night <laughs> that I spent with Dave, it was never boring. Not, not in the least. I mean, we were talking nonstop about AK, research, chiropractic, uh, teaching, education. And uh, it was, I realized that uh, with his dedication and energy and enthusiasm, that that's where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And I ended up uh, joining the practice later that year. And uh, anyway, the, got close to Dave, uh, had, had the wonderful opportunity to practice with Ben for years. And <laughs> we, we have many more great stories from Thank those you. years. <laughs> well, and, and hopefully we'll get to the ones that are, that are tellable uh, and, and that uh, will we'll not embarrass either one of the three of us. Um, well, my first recollection of Dave was I, I was still a student at uh, CMCC and I was about to graduate in June of 78. So I'm the young one of the group. And uh, so we went to the Parker Seminar in Las Vegas, and I figured, okay, it'd be great to get some practice management stuff. And this is when the main speaker was Governor Ronald Reagan, when he started his run for president in 1978. And so this is, you know, Canadian kid and his American wife are there. And it's like, it, there were 7,000 docs there in the, in the opening session, and it was awesome. So we're leaving, and all of a sudden, the Secret Service pushed people out of the way, and we almost got trampled on by... Uh, Ronald Reagan. Well, the next thing you know, I'm standing beside Dave Walther as this group goes by. And I said, are, are you Dr. Walther? He says, yes. He says, are you going to come to my class tomorrow, young man? I said, absolutely. I'm going to be there tomorrow. And, and so that, that was my first uh, meeting with Dave. And then, so then what happened was um, I became a member of ICAK like a week after I graduated. And so I followed Dave around at the Parker seminars for a year. Um, and that's kind of how our, our relationship started until fast forward till 1984. And as, as you both acutely know, Dave was definitely a morning person. So he 
he's living in Denver mountain time. He calls me in Toronto six o'clock in the morning, Toronto time. So we're talking four o'clock mountain time, right? He calls, he says, um, you want to move to the U S and join my practice at Dave, can I go to the bathroom first? And, uh, <laughs> and, and I said, like, what's up? He says, well, Bob Blake's leaving the practice and I want somebody to come and join the practice. So the short of that long story is Sandy and I and our 18 month old daughter come down to Pueblo and Dave had a big barbecue in the backyard. And that's when like the three of us really you know, got together um, because we were the same generation. And of course, Dave brought us together. So yeah, that, that's my, my first recollection of Dave. So, so now I want to ask you guys, first of all, I never saw Dave drink anything other than Rob Roy. So I've never had, well, what the heck is a Rob Roy? Bob, I think you you would need you need to answer that, Bob. Yeah, that's right. Well, there's the there's the classic version of a Rob Roy, and then uh, there was the way Dave loved to have it, which was uh, basically scotch, uh, red vermouth, sweet vermouth, and Dave liked it with a twist, yes, with not a twist. with a cherry because that was too, a little too sweet. But uh, so he would have his <laughs> scotch, vermouth, and uh, twist. That's well, how well, he liked it. Well, Rob there's, Roy. There, there's one piece missing though. I don't think I saw Dave drink a Rob Roy without a cigarette in his hand. Well, there was that. There was that. Okay, so so what brand of cigarettes did he smoke? Like, not that we cared, but Ben uh, would know. That's a great. <laughs> trivia. I might have right? tried a few with him, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what brand. Okay, so now now I want to ask you. It's like okay, if, if you can relate to me something that Dave. Uh, imparted to you, did for you that changed your life dramatically. So, so if you, if you got a tidbit that's, you know, he, how he influenced your life that if we didn't know each other, you'd say, oh, I don't believe that. That's like, no, that, that never happened. So Ben, tell us something like un, other than your first meeting with him as a, as a patient, but, but as a, as an adult now, as a doctor, something that dramatically impacted you and changed your life forever. Well, I, I think the biggest thing that, that he did was give, him, give me George Goodhart's name that I will always forever be grateful for. As all of us got steered somehow towards applied kinesiology and George Goodhart was just him pointing George out. To, I, maybe, you know, we all could have gone down that path in another way, but to steer me towards George from the first moment I walked onto the Palmer campus was uh, probably a, one of the biggest things. And the other thing is, I think and Bob would say this too, is uh, yeah, you just learned a lot. He, he, was, he was one of the most organized men you could run into. And a lot of people don't know this about him, but just before he met George Goodhart, he was in the process of really becoming a, like, a professional practice management teacher and consultant. Because he, he was so good at and all the things for your charting and paperwork and with Gene, his wife, having systems DC and printing everything. Um, he was, he was going to be a practice management consultant. And then when he met George, it was applied kinesiology and then, and then the, you know, the rest is history. I remember the first time I went in Dave's library Now he had a massive oh. library. He had his own Dewey Decimal system in his own library that he knew he could put his hand on anything instantly. That if, if you named the author or the article, or, I mean, that's how organized this man was. And it was like unbelievable to see his library in, in the lower level of the house. So, okay, Bob, something that, that dramatically changed your life from Dave. Well, um, I was fortunate uh, in that at National College and uh, I, I was introduced to applied kinesiology really in my first semester when I met Wally Schmidt and uh, George Goodhart used to lecture in Chicago and the students in National would, would come to see them, come to see him and, and he would inspire us so amazingly. And uh, so I, I had a pretty good uh, handle and knowledge of AK when I actually, when I graduated from National, but I, didn't have a sense of really how to change people's lives. Of how, and, and interestingly, maybe uh, after a year or so of practice, and I, I was really good at getting people well. <laughs> and I'd get people well in two or three treatments or, and, and anyway, I, but I had a very small practice. <laughs> and after about a year of that, uh, I talked to 
Dave about this dilemma of, you know, I mean, Ben had this great practice going. He inherited a lot of Dave's practice. And I think he learned a lot from Dave and kept it all going. And I had to kind of start from scratch. And, and uh, so I was talking to Dave about my dilemma with the small practice. And he said, well, what's your goal when you treat a patient? And I said, my goal was to get them well as fast as possible. And he kind of shook his head. And he said, well, my goal is to make every patient a lifelong referring patient. And in his goal, what that meant is that he had to educate people. He didn't have to just get them well. He had to educate them about how this stuff works and how chiropractic and applied kinesiology can not only benefit them, but benefit their family, their kids, their spouses, their family, their friends. And, and he was so dedicated to patient education. And as we all know, he became so dedicated to the doctor education and developing through his books and through applied kinesiology education. Um, but at any rate, once I, once I, I changed my goal to, to make every patient a lifelong referring patient, it, it took on a different dimension. It, it really meant sharing what we do. It meant uh, educating patients about the potentials that they can encounter with chiropractic and applied kinesiology. And at any rate, that was, that was an instrumental part for me, my practice taking off, because once I did that, uh, everybody's referring everybody. <laughs> so that was instrumental to me. Excellent. Excellent. Well, well, I have a little bit different story. So, you know, I started my practice in June of 78. And so we went to Parker every two to three months or whatever it was, we followed Dave around. So Sandy and I finally decided we should have a family. Right. And so I remember it like it was like yesterday. And so it was a Dallas in, in, in Dallas, the old Sheraton downtown, and um, I said to, to Dave, I said, listen, can I take you and Gene out for lunch? I just want to pick your brain a little bit. He said, sure. So, so we go for lunch and it was like the, the, the top of the Sheraton, a nice restaurant and everything. And um, he says, well, well, how can I help? And I said, well, Sandy and I are, want to start a family. And we just, we're not getting it done. We, we, we can't get it done. And he says, well, okay. So he, he went through a case history. And, and if you got to know Dave even remotely, he, had, he was very stoic and had a very dry humor. And so after doing a case history at the lunch table, he says, well, well, do you, I said, he said, tell me one thing that you know that probably every, nobody knows else knows. I said, well, I've never seen my wife sweat. You know, when she works out or anything, I like physically no perspiration coming out of her body. And, and he straight laced face straight laced face said well she just doesn't work hard enough and we kind of sat there like stunned like that right <laughs> it, it, we were speechless and then all of a sudden he cracked this little smile and he says okay it's got nothing to do with it <laughs> so, but then the, the short of the long story is he he helped us with some nutritional things he guided me what to, to start working on sandy we got pregnant and the, the blessing was he and gene were at Diana's Christening, which was then the start of Dave's uh, four-part series of the Cranial TMJ Seminar. So he, he launched that in Toronto a weekend after Diana's Christening in uh, 1982. So he, he kind of became part of the family uh, because he helped us start our family. And so that was kind of way cool. But uh, again, it's like he had, had such a dry humor that you didn't know if he was kidding or dead serious. And um, if you didn't know, Dave, that was, and the Rob Wright were probably two of his hallmark things. So, yeah. Okay. So now um, tell us something. Uh, we all know Dave's professional accomplishments. Tell us something that, you know, you, you just say, no, no, that, that's, that couldn't be Dave. That's too funny to be Dave. So tell us something comical about Dave because he, he was a very funny guy, but it's like, he was so straight laced that it's like, you couldn't believe it. So go ahead, Ben. Well, um, 
<laughs> okay, now hold on. You got you got to keep this clean, and it can't be <laughs> something that happened after three a.m. You know when you guys were on the road with him and Paul White. No, okay. So I, I should have given you some background. Yeah, some parameters. parameters. I, yeah, parameters. I need to reel you in a little bit. We can do that after we go offline. We can talk about those stories. But okay, remember this is for public consumption. Well, I, you know, Dave did have a good sense of humor, and especially if he had a Rob Roy or two, because he worked extremely hard, and and we all worked very hard around Dave. If you're around Dave, he, he did he did have a good German work ethic, and uh, you would work hard all week in practice just in time to get on an airplane to go to a seminar that weekend to teach, and so we'd let our hair down, and uh, we had so many good times teaching, and and, and I think just. A little bit of a side note from where you ask us to go here, but I think w- one of the things that Dave and Paul White is in White Walter seminars that they started just as Bob and I were arriving in town, so to speak. Um, you know, the, we were doing uh, 10 session programs in three cities concurrently going on across the country uh, from Orlando to San Diego, to LA, to St. Louis, to Kansas yep. city, to Denver. And so we were, and then there were going on in Paris and London and Oslo and cruise ship seminars. And I, Dave and Paul White, I mean, to their credit and, and they brought us in, but I mean, spreading the news in the early days about applied kinesiology, those guys were workhorses in getting the word out and large classes. Remember, Bob, you know, in L.A. at Santa Monica. I mean, you, you could have 200 in a class easy. Absolutely. The fire marshal, the fire marshal would be speaking to us uh, for, for room. So and we, and we had a good time. Uh, I, I was a country farm boy and I got introduced to fine dining and, uh, you know, stayed out late. We did have a good time, but we worked hard. As I believe, Bob, you could kick him from here. <laughs> We did work. We worked very hard. I mean, we were we were certainly we were practicing five days a week. We'd have a we'd have a seminar meeting at least once a week uh, for every topic that we were going to teach. I mean, th- this is an example of how Dave really instilled in us how to be good teachers. I mean, for every topic we were going to teach, we had this whole outline not only about the content but what the goal was, what the explanation was, what the visuals were, what you know, everything that we were going to do. So we were so well organized when we were going to present a topic, and and that's part of what um, made our seminars so successful, um, which was great. And an additional thing I was going to say about Dave, which. Dave was fortunate and he had a few hobbies. So you asked about his personal life. He was so fortunate that his biggest hobbies were photography and metalwork. And, and when you look at how he applied his hobbies, so he used the metalwork part to build the most amazing Cybex laboratory that existed anywhere in the world at that time. And it was right there in our office. He uses photography interest to uh, do all the photography for his textbooks, for the pamphlets, for, for all that. But he, he was so fortunate to be able to bring together his loves, his interests, and do it in a way that, uh, that influenced so many people's lives. And, and the other thing that, that we, we should say about Dave, and it, which is true with every one of us that are married, um, is that his wife, Jean, what he he told me he had, he had all his employees take a, an employee entrance test and whatever the name of it was it tested your kind of like an IQ test and it was a long written test there and you and and Gene scored the highest on it of anybody that had taken the test he told me and um, she she was a formidable woman she was smart talented and. Like say at our, at our staff meetings, um, either Monday or Tuesday night after a seminar, you know, she's back. She had been out there and the rest of us were supposed to be filling out forms on our grammar that weekend on how did we say a certain subject, a certain sentence? Did we use the word uh, too many times when we're speaking? Um, like it, it was, she, she was a great partner to Dave and he couldn't have done everything he did without Gene Walter. So just to say, give to give Gene some kudos. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and in fact, I just to, to 
piggyback on that is like she, she was Dave's, I think this is going to come out wrong. She was Dave's biggest champion and Dave was her biggest champion. It's like she took care of his every little need so that all he had to worry about was the finished product. And she helped him execute beyond excellence at whatever it was he did, whether it was seeing patients, whether it was the travel arrangements for the seminars and the hotel arrangements and all that stuff to, you know, the mountain of slides that went with you guys to seminars, which I was one of those junkies I'd get on an airplane and I had an eight tray slide carousel I'd take with me <laughs> wherever I went. So, so I, I bought into the technology of the presentation with Dave. So now, you know, like one of our, our dear friends who's now chairman of the education committee, Lawrence Calderon says to me, he says, how'd you learn how to do all that stuff where you do all those slides? And I said, I learned all that stuff from Dave Walters that he had a down path that, okay, if the room is so wide and so long, then you can't use these colors on the slide because then the people at the back won't see it. And you have to use, the, you know, he had the technology down. And this is back when you literally handmade slides or you took your own pictures, never mind cut and paste off the internet, but, but he had all that figured out. And it's like, he would put PowerPoint and Microsoft to shame with what they do with their PowerPoint technology stuff because he knew more about presentations, you know, 50 years ago than, than Microsoft knows now. But what it did was it captivated the audience and it drew people in and it taught them the stuff that, you know, they needed to know that he felt was important. And, and I know it made your guys' job a whole lot easier, but Gene, I think, was, was the the in my mind, the forgotten driving force of what really put Dave on a different level from a lot, a lot of people in AK because of his tremendous contributions with, with all the writing and all the seminars and all those things. So yeah, absolutely. And in fact, Gene, uh, I don't think I ever saw Gene drink anything else other than a Rob Roy too. So um, <laughs> it, it was like standard ops. Okay. So now I am going to, while we're playing this, I'm going to have the head mater D come in and we're going to get a picture of Rob Roy He's brought into the seminar room. So whoever wants to have a taste of a Rob Roy, I'm going to make sure that everybody gets a taste of a Rob Roy here, here in Atlanta at our ICA gay seminar. So uh, we'll have a toast to Dave and to Gene, and we must of course do it with Rob Roy's. What other things can you tell me about Dave? Dave's legacy that somebody might not know. Um, there's a story I like to tell. Uh, this, this is kind of my own observation, uh, but I think it speaks to Dave's legacy. Remembering George Goodhart so much, uh, it, if you ask George Goodhart a question, he typically, if he's thinking about an answer to a question, he, he would look up. Some maybe maybe right maybe left, but he would always look up, and and uh, I always saw George as kind of, you know, he was bringing in this brilliant information from God or from the cosmos, or you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, in, inspiring us all and in bringing in the great creative information. And Dave, if you asked him a question, he always looked down. And, uh, and I don't mean this in any derogatory way whatsoever, but I, I really think looking back on it, Dave, Dave brought this grounding effect. This Dave helped to concretize AK. He brought this grounding effect through his textbooks. Um, and it, it was so wonderful to have the tools that we have that Dave created with his textbooks, with his pamphlets, with his patient education, and in documenting so much of AK. And it was an, an amazing balance when you look back at uh, George and, and Dave and, and, and different people and how they bring things in. Um, but I'm very grateful to Dave for his grounding effect on AK and the ICAK for so many years. Well, and, and to that point, Bob, what we're seeing now in the uh, probably 57th transition of AK education uh, of how we should disseminate what we knew, it is very difficult to replicate what Dave did um, in terms of not just cate categorizing the material, but the presentation, then what topics should go on what weekend 
And, and he just was so organized that part of our dilemma now is the, the, the education dissemination from an official ICAK standpoint, I think is, is missing his organizational expertise. Um, and, and to me, that was, I, I really bought into that hook, line and sinker. Um, and because it, what we, we raised our kids when they were young, if you're familiar with the Suzuki violin method, you know, it, it, their approach is, okay, you assimilate first and then you dissect later. And that's what Dave taught me is like, you need to teach people how to muscle test. Okay. And then, then worry about, okay, the 15 things that an inhibited muscle is related to instead of worrying, okay, this muscle is related to these 50 things, but you never know how to test the muscle kind of thing. So to, to me, that was the, the lasting legacy of Dave is his organizational skills in putting forth what AK was, is, and how it should be executed, I think is, is a, a huge testament to Dave. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of that because I, whenever I teach, when I, I prepare a lecture, I'm always thinking, okay, what would Dave say I could do to improve this? And if I got my color combinations right, if I got the font size right, and, you know, he would say, okay, you don't put more than, you know, 10 words on a slide if you don't have to. And like all those things, they just, they, it's like a little voice talking in my ear every time. And it's like, I'm so grateful that, that, that Dave shared those things unselfishly with me to, to make me a better person. You know, an, another thing in, in terms of the big contributions, Dave would always in anything in the ICAK and ICAK and AK education, he would always take the very strong position that AK and manual muscle testing is used in conjunction with other diagnostic criteria. And, and, and as Ben said earlier, I mean, Dave wanted to measure everything. That's why he had the greatest equipment, you know, everywhere. He loved to measure everything. And, and when we do that, we get a much better number one context for doing manual muscle testing and applied kinesiology, but a much greater uh, level of appreciation of the results and, and what it can actually do. If I were to say one word that I think about when I think about Dave, a word is precision. Dave, Dave was about precision from the manual muscle test, from where you go with the results, from precision in how he would do a cranial correction. And he, as you know, he got so um, involved with, you know, correction of the feet, correction of the cranium, but everything was always about precision. And through that, he got phenomenal results and he certainly inspired us all and, and, and taught us all a great deal to, to appreciate and utilize precision. I think one other thing I'd like to say to that, Bob, is, is that he was also very meticulous, whether it was in a private conversation from the lecture podium or in his writings, he was meticulously give credit to where he got the information from. Absolutely. And he, and he always honored that. And that's, to me, that has always stuck with me. It's like, I always said, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not the greatest, you know, sharpest tack in the box, but I probably stole everything I know, but you know what, I'm going to tell you where I got it from. And I, and I got that instilled uh, from Dave because he honored every little sentence that, that he used, he honored the person or the source of where he got it from. And so I encourage and demand that, you know, we in continuing in AK also do the same. It's like, you know, just tell us where you got this stuff from and how you tweaked it. And, and as uh, Richard Belly says, he says, okay, this is my dance until you learn how to do it. And then you create your own dance, so to speak. And I think Dave would, would resonate with that as long as you say, okay, where did you learn the original dance from? And that's really so much what his textbooks are about. I mean, that's why they have hundreds and hundreds of references in almost every chapter. Uh, he, would, he was uh, you know, such an avid reader, documenter, uh, and he would put stuff together uh, from everything that he would read and, and do the best job he could, as, as you said, to give credit to where it came from and uh, make it sensible and usable for people. I, I, I just, everything you said is just right on about precision, organization, and, 
and and it was alluded to, as you said also, Bob, I, I, and we've always said this, his hobbies, the photography, the writing, the, it, the things he liked to do on the side just complicated everything he did at work. The only time he wasn't working was when they would go to dinner. That's only that's all he did. That, that, and he was he was the hardest, one of the hardest working people I've ever been around. I mean, I, I like to work, but I like to take a little more time off than, than he did. But he and yes. Gene would put their time in and he was just a solid, hard worker, very organized, very precise, as you said. And, uh, and, and, and as I said earlier, I, I, you know, he didn't say things without thinking like a lot of us do. I, it, when he said something, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like the old advertising about Merrill Lynch or something. Somebody says something and everybody stops what they're doing and listens. I mean, if you're smart and you were around Dave, you listen to what he said, because more often than not, he was probably right on target. And he, he, he was a great, wise man. He ran it. All of us who had, had, were fortunate that there were so many people that came around George Goodhart. The, the, the Sheldon Deals, the Otis Thomases, the uh, Alan Beardalls, and the David Walters, and the Walter Smiths. How fortunate have we all been to be around this collective uh, wisdom that all of these fine clinicians bring? That's amazing. Ben, when I, when I, and you, you were there for many and many of them, when I realized in the years I was with Dave, I, I spent, I taught, over 100 weekend seminars with Dave, over 100 weekends. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of dinners, travel time together, preparation. Seminar. But it was a lot of learn. I'm so grateful for that. It was so much learning and so much fun, and it was all uh, just very, very upbeat and and exciting to be sharing what we were doing with the world. Yeah, it was very fun. It was very fun. We made it, uh, it's so much work, but when, when the when seminar came and the show started, we had a great time. And Gene Walther uh, had told my wife, Shelly, um, she called those days when all of these seminar, I mean, there was a rare weekend we weren't teaching and uh, Gene Walther called those the glory days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they were. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I'd agree with that. And it's, and it's just like, um, we, we kind of need to wrap this up, gentlemen. And so I want, I want to leave one thought, and that is, you know, I, I, I can hear the tone in both of your voices, but I'm going to change the, the prism a little bit. And that is, uh, this is going to be a commercial for why students need to join ICAK, like we did when we were like, not even out of college, we were going to ICAK meetings. And so um, it, it, we all remember when we were teaching, we talked about the neurolymphatic, or we talked about my favorite one is the anaerobic aerobic muscle fault. And we talked about that because he tested that on a downhill skier at the Lake Placid Olympics. That patient was a patient of mine. I was in the room when George presented the discovery to the world. And, and we can say that about hundreds and hundreds of different topics. Everybody's excited about fatty acid metabolism. Wally Schmidt presented essential fatty acid metabolism in the early 1980s before nobody knew what it was. And so as a collective, and Dave was one of the spearheads of this collective, and that is AK literally is the spearhead of the, the health innovation and cultural revolution of what healthcare is possible of. And so I, I can't thank Dave and Gene enough for, for kicking me out of the nest and more importantly, probably handcuffing me and dragging me with them uh, down the road. And, and um, I love working, but I couldn't keep up with Dave. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so um, a last thought, uh, gentlemen, but uh, he's a wonderful man. And then we'll, we'll have a salute and then we'll have everybody join us for a Rob Roy. Where I, what I think of, um, Evan, as you say, that is uh, what's coming next for the ICAK. What's coming next? I mean, we're, we're talking about a golden era that we had. It was such a rich educational time for us where we shared AK with thousands of people and we got better at it and we got better at teaching it. Um, 
we're ready for a new a new wave and another wave. And that's got to come from the younger people coming into AK that that are inspired about AK that have the vision and see it um, as a leading force in healthcare, just as we all did. Um, so I, uh, I I salute the younger people there. I salute everyone there, and I, I really incur. I mean, we're, we're, it's time for another Dave Walther, if there ever will be. But 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 someone to write you know write new books. Someone to take that level of dedication to AK and bring it up again. You know that, that that's what's got to happen. Yeah, somebody needs to stand on the shoulders of of these giants. Exactly. And uh, it, it and to carry that kind of force forward, and so I just like to say for my final part of this that <clears throat> we it's hard to do David Walther justice in our words for all the many years he toiled, the board meetings he sat in, and the the weekends he worked to get the the uh, ICAK to where it is today. And it was just an honor and a privilege for all of us uh, to have worked with him and to know him. And uh, God, you know, God bless you, Dave Walton. Absolutely. Okay, so fellas, if you can raise your glass. And uh, again, I'm going to make sure uh, whoever's in the audience, we're going to have the chance to have them at least smell the Rob Roy. So uh, uh, to our mentor, our friend, uh, Dave and his wife, Jean, bless you. And thank you for taking us for an unbelievable ride. And we are forever grateful and in your debt to Dave and Gene. To Dave, Dave and Gene. Absolutely. And this is a real Rob Roy right there. <laughs> well, well, now that I know what it is, okay, we'll have everybody experience it. I'd like to close this tribute to my dear friend, mentor, and colleague, Dr. David S. Walther, by again quoting from the Tao Te Ching 70th verse. Chinese medicine identifies two main sources of vital energy that determine our ability to survive adversity. First, is our genetic chi inherited from our parents? Second, is the acquired chi and its vital energy that derives from our lifestyle, that is from air we breathe, the food and drink we ingest, our exposure to the sun, and emotions through which we relate to others, and the people and their energy with whom we most directly intersect. Lao Tzu differentiates four kinds of people in this verse. Let's see what Lao Tzu would say about David S. Walther. First, those who seem to have been born to live, these are the three out of every 10 people identified as having inherited strong genetic constitution from their parents. I think that applies to Dr. Walther both his parents were chiropractors, very strong chiropractic proponents of lifestyle choices and the lifestyle of chiropractic. Two, those who seem to have been born to die because they seem not to have selected their parents so wisely. Well, I don't think this one applies to Dave. He had very strong German roots for his parents that he learned lifestyles and work ethics that we talked about with Dr. Markham and with Dr. Blake. Third, those whose choice of lifestyle determines whether they live lifefully or deathfully. Those that lead a lifestyle that supports their vital energy facilitate their own health and longevity well. Those who led a lifestyle that challenges and insults the vital energy weaken their health and invite an early death. Fourthly, lastly, are those who seem to be impervious to harm and premature death because they live in harmony with others with the universe and with themselves. I think number three and number four also sound like Dr. David S. Walther. Lao Tzu recommends alternative consciousness transforming our own personal lives as we participate in the transformation of the lives of others. It is only after we succeed in attaining these goals that any of us will be walking the waters, never fearing that weapons will harm us because there will be no harmful weapons in a place that embraces creation. David S. Walther knowingly heeded Lao Tzu's recommendation of the alternative consciousness of applied kinesiology transforming our own personal lives as we participate in the transformation of the lives of our fellow man. Thank you and bless you Dave Walther for transforming myself, AK, and ICAK. <laughs>